and take your Bibles and go to John chapter 3. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, then you should have something to worry about. Uh, because life is fleeting. The pages are turning fast. In a moment, we will blink and we will be in eternity in one way or the other. We're going to leave this world. And today, Jesus, we're going to see him in a new portrait of him. I, Brother West has already told you, I'm sure, that we're looking through the book of John. Each chapter paints a different portrait of Jesus. And today in John chapter 3, we're going to see Jesus as the divine teacher. Uh, and he gets a chance here to teach us a wonderful lesson uh, about the new birth, which will alleviate any uh, worries regarding eternity. And we have a lot of ground to cover today, so I'm not going to dilly-dally. We're going to get right after it. John chapter 3, look with me. We'll read through verses 4, and then we'll pick up from there, okay, just a little bit. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he Enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born. Let's go to God again in prayer and ask his blessings upon the reading of his word today. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you that even though we might have worries and frets in this world, we, we thank you that we can have peace and assurance in our blessed hope, Jesus Christ. And today as we look at our Savior in his teaching role and the portrait of him being divine, to heart the lesson that he gives us today, the lesson of the new birth. And our prayer is, God, that if there's uh, one today that is among us in our presence who's never experienced being spiritually reborn, that today they would see this truth. Hear it not from my mouth, but from the mouth of Jesus, the divine teacher. And may they heed that truth and may they come to knowledge of it and accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. We pray, God, that you bless the reading of your word now. May your people be blessed. May our hearts be encouraged, and we give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. In this great chapter, we do see Jesus as the divine teacher. Now, remember that Jesus came to teach us some things. He taught us how to flee darkness and come unto light. He teaches us how to flee death and come unto life. But now, in John chapter 3, we see that Jesus gets the opportunity to sit down and teach a teacher, Nicodemus. Nicodemus was an instructed man. Here is somebody that uh, has a lot of things going for him. And the truth is, there are probably people in our congregation today who are in the same condition that Nicodemus was in. Nicodemus was a successful man. He was somebody who was a respected teacher. He was a man with money. He had power. He had prestige. He had all the trappings of success, yet Nicodemus lacked one very important, one major thing. He lacked a real personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll give him credit. He comes looking for it. So here he approaches Jesus, and he's asking some questions. And Jesus, our divine teacher, is going to teach not only Nicodemus, he is going to teach all of us about the new birth which, by the way, is essential to you leaving this life and going to heaven someday, okay? So bear in mind that this is of the utmost importance. Let's notice a few things. If you're taking notes, you might notice, first of all, the mystery of the new birth in verses 1 through 4. The mystery of the new birth. And notice the character of Nicodemus. Uh, what Nicodemus was like, he was a ruler. He was a man who was probably a member of the Sanhedrin council. And such a man, he was a powerful man. He not only was a ruler, he was religious. The Bible says in verse 1 that he was a Pharisee. Therefore, he had to adhere to the strictest of religious ethics and standards. And, and he was definitely all those things. You know, not all Pharisees were great hypocrites. Not all of them were terrible. There were some who actually did their best to try to live up 
uh, to the standards of their religion who did their best to try to live in true holiness. And I believe that Nicodemus was probably a man of that caliber. But not only was Nicodemus a ruler and was he religious, here's the most important thing about Nicodemus. Nicodemus was real. He was a real person who was seeking real answers and seeking real truth. You notice that he comes to Jesus at nighttime. This has been affectionately referred to as the first episode of Nick at Night. And so <clears throat> he comes to Jesus at nighttime. And, and I notice that there's something about Nicodemus that strikes us is that he's a person who maybe he's a ruler, maybe he's religious, and all of that is fine and dandy. But he was somebody who was really seeking, sincerely seeking the truth of the matter. And so he comes to Jesus, and he comes at night. And for whatever reason he comes at night, maybe it's for fear of criticism from the other Pharisees. Uh, maybe it's because he just simply wanted to have an uninterrupted conversation with the teacher, Jesus. But we see all these things about his character. Either way, Nicodemus was somebody who wanted to get things right. Notice, secondly, the compliment of Nicodemus here. Not only his character, but you see his compliment. He addresses Jesus not like the other Pharisees. He's not seeking to trap Jesus. He's not seeking to make Jesus out to be a liar. He actually comes and refers to Jesus as rabbi, which is teacher. He's, he comes to him and he says, teacher. And he gives him a, a high regard and he addresses Jesus with a certain realization that he understood something that the other Pharisees didn't understand, and that was that, that Jesus had come from God. He said, we understand that thou art a teacher come from God. Nobody can do the things that you're doing, that you're doing, except God sent him here. And so he gives him some compliment and some regard and some, and some value, and he has some vague understanding of the fact that Jesus was somebody. He was a good teacher, and he was all of these things. But then Nicodemus, he stops short on his estimation of who Jesus really is. You see, Nicodemus, like most religious people, stops short at recognizing Jesus as a great teacher. I want to ask you a question. Was Jesus a great teacher? Of course he was. Was he a great example? Of course he was. I, was he a, a great prophet? Of course he was. But Jesus was far more than all of those things. Jesus was the incarnate God, the man of God brought down in flesh to live among us, to fulfill the law, and then go to the cross and die for our sins. But Nicodemus is showing his religiosity here as he comes short in his recognition of who Jesus is as just a good teacher. But that is the problem. Listen, that is the problem with all religion. All religion stops short of who Jesus really is. I mean, Jesus is, yes, he's a necessity in some religions, but he, he's, he's Jesus plus baptism plus confirmation plus church membership plus communion or something else in a religious sense. But let me tell you something. The new birth is Jesus plus nothing minus nothing. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, not your works, not your religion, not your good deeds. It is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Listen, it's not of us, it's of Jesus. He came to die for us, and the new birth is something we get through him. It is Jesus plus nothing, minus nothing. Imagine for a moment that the CIA wanted to bring you in as an agent and put you behind the, the bamboo curtain of China, and they would train you to talk and look and to think Chinese, and you would go to school and you would learn their language and, and you would speak it fluently without any traces of your redneck hick accent in your Chinese because it really kind of loses its effect when you put the Oklahoma twang in the Chinese. After you study their, their physical characteristics and you begin to duplicate their mannerisms and, and perhaps you even undergo plastic surgery so that you can even look Chinese and they, they drop you in there and you begin to act Chinese to the point and speak Chinese to the point that nobody can recognize any differences between you or anybody else. That would be great. But it, would it make you Chinese? Go like this. No. Some of you are like, I don't know, would it? <laughs> no. The answer is no. Biology tells us no. In order for you to be Chinese, you must be born to Chinese parents. 
You, and the same is true with our Christianity. I mean, we can put on the T-shirts. We can, we can put up some signs and we can have Bible verses and all of these things around us. We can sing gospel songs. We can be members of a church. We can do good things. But until you're born again into the family of God, you're not a Christian. I mean, we can look Christian. We can act Christian. You know, I, once a year, we typically take the youth over to a Christian concert. We haven't done it the last year or so because they've been doing it on Sunday nights in Tulsa, and I go to church on Sunday nights. So, um, but when we go, I, there would be we had to get in line, and we would have to stand there for like four hours in the cold just to be able to get in and and get a seat. And so I would take gospel tracks with me and little little gadget tracks where I could get the attention of people, and I would go around for four hours and just share the gospel with people, share the truth with them. And, um, I, and I had one person ask me, he said, why do you do that? We're at a Christian concert. I said, just because someone's at a Christian concert doesn't mean they're a Christian. I mean, we can all look the part, but until you've been born again, you're not a Christian. Just because you have a shirt on, just because your radio is dialed in the 94.1 or 95.1 or 88.9 or whatever it is it's dialed into, that does not make you a Christian. Hey, you can be on our church membership role and not be a Christian. You must be born again. That's the mystery. Here's the challenge to Nicodemus, thirdly here. Uh, Jesus ignores his pious platitudes and compliments, and he addresses the need of Nicodemus' heart. He tells Nicodemus that his religion isn't sufficient to save his soul. He tells Nicodemus that he must experience a new birth. Being a divine teacher, Jesus uses a common illustration that he would understand. He talks about being born again. Everybody's been born. Now, I don't know about you. I just barely remember it. Uh, but we've all been born. We can all understand the concept of this. And he's telling Nicodemus, like, hey, here, here's the thing. I know you're religious. I know you're a teacher. I know that you know some things. But here's what you really need, and that is to be born again. Not be religious. Be born again. And you look at all this, the nature of this birth is that that word again, it literally means from a higher place. To be born from a higher place, it gives the idea uh, of something that only comes from God and not from anything else. That's the nature of the new birth. Man cannot accomplish it. The new birth is the work of God and God alone. A Christian is not someone who has just gotten better. A Christian is somebody who's been made new through faith in Jesus Christ. He's not a tadpole that turns into a frog. He's really more like a frog that turns into a prince. He's a brand new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. That's the challenge of Nicodemus was you must be born again. And he says here, he says, except you be born again, you shall not see the kingdom of God. Now, if you write in your Bible, you might underscore that word except. Here's the necessity of the new birth. It's an imperative. It literally means that a person has no other choices in the realm of salvation other than the new birth. You cannot be saved by your religion. Hey, Brother West can't save you. Brother Matt can't save you. Florence Street can't save you. Being a member here can't save you. Your baptism, and that's, that's a big one, baptism. Everybody thinks your baptism saves them. Baptism does not save you. You must be born again, born from on high, an act of God by faith, putting my faith in God's grace through Jesus Christ who died on the cross. And I experience a new birth, and there's no other way. So what Jesus has done for us, here's what I love about what Jesus has done for us. You know, the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. Is that correct? Yeah. Who do you think the author of confusion is? Satan is. So Satan is the one that plants the little seeds of doubt and says, hey, there are many paths to heaven. Hey, there's a path to your heaven and a path to your heaven and a path to my heaven. All that confusion does not come from God. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Except you be born again, you shall not see the kingdom of heaven. He eliminates all confusion. He takes Nicodemus' religion and sets it over here to the side and says, listen, you need to be born again. And the same is true for all of us. You see the confusion of Nicodemus and at the end of all of this in verse 4. Nicodemus is confused like so many others. He's confused about the things of God, and he confuses them with the, the things of the flesh. Nicodemus says, how can I be born when I'm old? 
can I enter a second time into my mother's womb and be born again? It's a thing that would be absolutely impossible. That there are so many who don't understand the plan of salvation. But when you try to think in human terms, it doesn't make any sense. It's a thing that is spiritually discerned by the Spirit of God. Did you know that, that there are certain things that only the Holy Spirit can teach you? Do you understand that? When the Spirit has come, He shall teach you. He will instruct you about sin and righteousness and judgment to come. Only the Holy Spirit can lay into your heart that it is not my religion, it is not my good works, it is not my deeds. Only the Spirit of God can help you discern spiritual things from fleshly things. 1 Corinthians. And it is the Spirit of God that is to help Nicodemus understand that Jesus is not talking about a physical birth. He's talking about a spiritual rebirth. He has no understanding. And if there's no understanding without the Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit of God drawing a man to the new birth, there's no understanding. If there's no understanding, there's no salvation. Amen. Notice secondly here, our second main thought is this. Not only the mystery of the new birth, but the meaning of the new birth. Nicodemus doesn't seem to understand this great mystery. We see the, the symbol of salvation here. So Jesus goes on being the divine teacher and explains it to him. Look in verse 5. Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? So he begins to try to explain to Nicodemus some things, and he uses a symbol of salvation here. He talks about the new birth being a birth of water and a birth of the Spirit. Now, he says that which is born of water is is natural it's a reference to some things that would confuse us a lot of people are confused by what jesus said here that we must be born of the water and of the spirit naturally people confuse that with what baptism well i have to be baptized but if if that were the case if the case was that we had to be spiritually born again and then born of the water to be baptized to be saved when then we're adding our good works to god's grace so that can't be the case. What he's using is a natural illustration to, 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 to uh, illustrate something that is supernatural. He talks about the natural birth because sometimes that's how it's referred to. Now, my wife had four babies, so I'm kind of familiar with it. But the water breaks. When the water breaks, business picks up, doesn't it? In case you guys don't know that you're going to have babies someday, when the water breaks, business is going to pick up. All right, you better get busy because that means a birth is about to take place. And when, when we're born physically, the water breaks and we're born. That's the first birth. And, and, and he's trying to help Nicodemus see this, that that which is born of the flesh is flesh. There's a water birth, but then there's a spiritual birth. Nicodemus had already experienced the first birth, but what Nicodemus needed and what all of us need is a second birth. A spiritual birth. You've already born in, been born in the flesh, but now you must be born again in the spirit. He talks about that. When the sinner turns to Jesus for salvation, the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit regenerates that person and gives him new and everlasting life. That's the spiritual second birth. When I was born on February 1st, 1979 in Ada, Oklahoma, my name was written down and recorded. And I got a social security card and I got a birth certificate and all those things which nobody could find. But in 1986, when I by faith got on my knees and cried out to God to forgive me of my sin, and I recognized Jesus as my Lord and Savior who died on the cross to save me, and I by faith I received his redemptive work on the cross, I was born once more. And my name was written down that day too, but it was written down in the Lamb's book of life, never to be blotted out. Hey, let me say that one more time. My name was written in the Lamb's book of life, never to be blotted out. Amen. 
I, it, listen, it, it amazes me that people hate the doctrine of security of the believer. It amazes me. Why would you hate that doctrine? And on what planet can you be unborn? I was born in 1979. Now, some people wish I would die, but I can't be unborn. I was born again in 1986. I cannot be unborn. My relationship with my Heavenly Father will never change. He'll always be my Heavenly Father. I'll always be His child. My fellowship can change. I can disobey Him. I can run from God. I can lose His blessing. I can receive uh, his correction but I will never lose my relationship with him he will always be my heavenly father just like I could never lose my relationship with my earthly parents they'll always be my parents you must be born again there's no escaping that what I love about it is just like with a newborn baby when a newborn baby's brought into this world there's no yesterdays to that baby only tomorrow you don't see a policeman waiting for a baby to come out and go, I got your record, buddy. Come on out here so I can arrest you. He has no record. She has no record. When you're born again, guess what? Your record is wiped clean with God. You are saved, sealed, and secured. And your sins, your crimes, have all been put on Jesus, and they've been paid in full. The secret of salvation he literally becomes a new creation in the Lord. He's fitted for heaven. He's ready for glory. While the natural man is only suited for this world, the redeemed person is forever changed by the power of God. Only God can really change a heart through the new birth. It isn't, listen, getting saved in a new birth isn't turning over a new leaf. It isn't turning your life around. It is giving everything you had to Jesus and Him making you new on the inside through His Spirit. And according to Jesus, there's no other option. You must be born again. There's no option B, no plan B. It's Jesus or nothing. He uses some imagery here in verses, uh, verse 8. He uses the imagery of the wind to describe the actions of the Holy Spirit. He says, the wind blows where it will. You hear the sound, but you don't know where it came from. You don't know where it's going. He kind of uses that to illustrate how the Spirit moves with power and purpose and is felt in the presence of other people's lives. And he touches you and he changes you from the inside. You know, Nicodemus would have been familiar with Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37, where, where he's taken up to see the, the, the valley of dead, dry bones. Ezekiel is, and God tells him uh, that th these bones are going to live again. And the Bible says that the wind moves across them, and they became alive again. They came back to life. The same thing happens in the life of a person when the Holy Spirit moves across that person. It changes you. It brings that which was dead back to life. The Bible says that the Spirit quickeneth us. That word quickeneth means to make alive. Before I knew Jesus, before the Holy Spirit of God got a hold of me and got inside of me, I was dead, spiritually dead, in my trespasses and my sins. But as soon as the Holy Spirit moved across my life and by faith I received Christ, I was made alive, just like the dry bones of Ezekiel 37. No longer dead in my sin, but dead to my sin. You ever get frustrated with people in this world that you try to witness to? that you try to show kindness to, you try to show Christ to them. You ever get frustrated with them when they reject you or they spew on you or they hate you? What do you expect? They're dead. They're dead. You're talking to dead people. Oh, they look alive. They look healthy. But spiritually, they are dead. And you need the Holy Spirit of God to move across them. That's the secret is the Holy Spirit of God has to be involved in this new birth. You ever try to argue somebody into heaven? How'd that go? That went well, didn't it? Hey, if you won the argument, guess what you did? You lost the person. Here's one thing that people try to overlook when it comes to salvation is the involvement of the Holy Spirit. He has to be involved in this new birth. The Holy Spirit draws men. We'll see that in just a second. Notice 
also the source of salvation, verse 13. It says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. In light of latter events, John could shed some light on Jesus' words to Nicodemus. Jesus, the source of salvation, came down from heaven, and he knows about heavenly things. If anybody had the authority to speak on heavenly things, it would be Jesus who came down from heaven and went back. He would know what to tell us. But notice the simplicity of salvation in verses 14 and 15. He gives them an old illustration from Israel's history about the serpents. He said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He takes them back to Israel's history. And he brings out an illustration of a time when the serpents had invaded the camp. Of Israel. You remember this? And people were being bitten by the serpents and they were dying. And Moses goes to God and God gives Moses instructions to make a brass serpent and put it on a pole. Which, by the way, is still a symbol used today in the medical field. He said, and lift it up. And whosoever shall look upon it shall live. He uses that as an illustration of Jesus, of himself. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... So must Jesus be lifted up. And our salvation doesn't come, Nicodemus. It doesn't come through your religion. It doesn't come through the Pharisees. It doesn't come through the Sanhedrin. It doesn't come through your rituals. It doesn't come through your goodness. It comes through looking to Jesus by faith. Look and live. Look to Jesus alone. Our job is to lift Jesus up so others might see him. Many people around us, friends, are... Snake bitten. They've been bitten by this world and the curse of sin. And many of them, listen, many of them don't even know they're sick. But we need to lift up Jesus. Religion makes it impossible to be saved. God makes it simple. The sinners just come by faith and repentance to Christ. And he says in verse 15, Whosoever believeth shall not perish. Notice lastly the message of the new birth. And we'll move quickly because we're out of time. Jesus has words of warning for those who would refuse him and salvation. You see here the world's greatest text. Look at verse 16. It's probably a very obscure text. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, and he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I love that verse. That is the hub of the Bible, isn't it? There's the world's greatest text. It shows God's demonstration of love, the depth of God's love. It shows us the way of salvation to Jesus. It shows us that once we are received by Christ, we receive everlasting life. The moment we believe, it never ends. But he goes on to say something else in verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. One day as it lows with Tim Gustafson and he had on a shirt that said John 3.16, the woman said at the counter, she said, do you know John 3.17? I said, yeah, I do. I said, do you know Nahum 1.7? <laughs> the Lord is good, the stronghold in the day of trouble. He knoweth them that trust in him. She said, well, I just see John 3.16 everywhere. And I said, yeah, I know John 3.17. I quoted it to her. I said, what about John 3.18? It's kind of a big deal, too. Let me read it to you. He that believeth on him is not condemned. To that we can all say amen. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. The world's greatest text is that God sent his Son to die for you. Not so that your religion can save you. Amen. So that you might believe in him and have free pardon of your sin and everlasting life. But the world's greatest text is followed by the world's greatest test. The test is what will you do with Jesus? And Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't come to condemn the world. You know why the world hates Jesus, though? The Bible tells us why it hates him. 
It, the world hates him because he came to destroy the works of the devil. And the world loves the works of the devil. You say, can you prove that? Yeah, look a little further. Verse 19, this is the condemnation. That the light has come into the world. The, world, the light is Jesus. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they were wrought in God. The world's greatest text teaches us that God loves us so much that he would send Jesus to die. But the world's greatest test is what will you do with Jesus? Will you run from light because your deeds are evil? Will you simply dismiss Jesus? Listen, Jesus cannot be dismissed. There has to be a decision made about Jesus. If you dismiss Jesus for your religion, then you will die in your religion, and you will go straight to hell. And I know, I know, I know that nobody wants to hear that today. But I'm going to tell you something. I don't want to hear anybody ever stand in, this, in, in the seat of judgment and say, Brother Matt never told me that if I died without Jesus, I would die and perish. I don't want him to say that either. The question is, what will you do with him? Would you come to him by faith today and receive him as your Lord and Savior? Will you come and say, God, I know that I have sinned and I have come short of the glory of God. God, I know I cannot trust in myself. And listen, <laughs> there are people here today who are trusting in themselves. You say, well, how could you say that? Because the statistics stack against us today. I knocked on too many doors. I've witnessed to too many people to know that there's not at least one person in this room who's trusting in themselves to get themselves to heaven. This past week, we were able to go to New Mexico the week before. And I thank you for the opportunity. What a tremendous, tremendous blessing. And we went out. We took out a bunch of kids and a bunch of their church members, and we went out and we knocked on 500 doors and began to share the gospel. That morning before we went out, I prayed. We all got together and we all prayed individually. Here's what I prayed for. I prayed for God to do one thing that would impact our kids, do something great. Whether it was bring a bunch of people to our party, bring a bunch of visitors to church on Sunday, and God did the best one of all. He allowed me to share the gospel with a man who received Christ with three of my teenagers present, gathered up with us, praying now I, I'm, I'm sharing this for one reason only because when I knocked on James Getz's door well actually I didn't knock on his door my kids beat me there he was sitting in the garage and I thought oh no I better hustle because who knows what they're telling me no <laughs> I went over and began to talk to James and I said I asked him this question I'm going to ask you this question I said James if you died today do you think you go to heaven and James like most people said yeah I, th I think I would when someone says I think I would um, immediately a red flag goes up I said James why would you go to heaven and I quote I was baptized I'm a good person I try to do what I can to help people and be a good citizen. I said, James, can I share with you what the Bible says? That there is none good, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. There's none righteous. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I gave him the good person test. You know it. He failed. You know why? Because there's none good. I said, now, James, based on the information I've given you from the Bible, and based on the good person test, you went four for four from the, from the Ten Commandments. You're guilty on four parts, so am I. I said, but based on that, if you stand before God, are you good or are you guilty? 
He said, I'm guilty. <laughs> Except the man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of heaven. I said, based on the information I've given you, what do you think that you need to do, James? And James said, I need to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Amen. I said, okay, James. I said, next question. When do you think you ought to do that? And to my surprise, he said, right now. I said, now, James, don't you, don't do this for me. I'll, if you want me to leave, you just say so. I'll turn around and walk off. I got a bunch of doors to go to. He said, no. He said, I have known for a long time something is missing. And listen, friends, if you've never received Christ as your Savior, if you're trusting in your baptism, your good works, all those things, something is missing. The most important thing is missing, and that's your faith in Jesus Christ, the new birth. Have you been born again? Yes. 